Good evening, everyone. My name is Natasha Bezega, and I will be your host and moderator this evening. On behalf of the Canadian RAP Implementation Committee, I would like to welcome you to our fifth science symposium, which is offered this year as a three-part virtual information series. I do apologize, I have an unstable internet connection this evening, so my camera is turned off. Um, tonight is our second session as part of our um, virtual series, and we'll begin with a opening prayer by Naomi Williams of Walpole Island First Nation followed by a short AOC 101 presentation by yours truly. Next, we will have a feature presentation on the fish and wildlife populations in the St. Clair River area of concern presented by April White, federal lead for the St. Clair River and Detroit River areas of concern. And after our future presentation this evening, we will hold a question and answer period and provide uh, all of you the opportunity to ask questions to our panel of experts. We have Shane DeSola, Ecotex Ecologist, Joe Fiorino, Habitat Ecologist, and April White. Tonight's session is being delivered using Zoom webinars. We kindly ask that you use the Q&A function located in your attendee toolbar to ask your questions, and I will then ask your questions to the panelists on your behalf. Please do not feel shy about asking questions. All questions are great questions. Hello. And uh, you'll also find some other uh, links there to some supporting documentation uh, if you're looking for more information on today's sessions. So before we begin, I just want to say a big thank you to our team of organizers and our technical support team who have made this event possible. And also thank you to each of our presenters and panelists who have made the time to, to present today. Uh, I also need to thank all of our attendees for overcoming their Zoom fatigue and joining us this evening. And as a reward, I'm happy to announce that we do have two door prizes. So we'll be drawing two names from our list of attendees and those two individuals will receive a small gift, uh, which includes a reusable water bottle donated by Walpole Island First Nation, a beautiful custom t-shirt featuring the Bats of Ontario designed by De Dennis Plain of Amjong First Nation and a $20 gift card. Uh, so we will announce our winners by email tomorrow. So be sure to check your inbox. And I think that wraps up our housekeeping for this evening. So please help me welcome Naomi Williams, who will deliver tonight's opening prayer. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, before I start tonight's opening prayer, uh, tonight is a, a full moon. And um, to our people, that's um, it's very significant because everything in creation has the spirit, the plants, the trees, the water, the wind, the rocks, the mountains, um, the sky, the moon, they, uh, they all have a spirit. And the, the cycle of the moon, it, um, it, it determines our yearly calendar in which each passing of the moon, it indicates a time for planting, harvesting and hunting. And, um, and during the full moon, we, we like to have ceremonies for that, um, respecting um, our, our grandmother moon, which uh, watches over us in the waters of the earth. So um, now I'm gonna be sharing a prayer that was um, uh, written by uh, one of our community members. Her name is Rita Sainz. And uh, I'll start that prayer now. And then I'll do the English interpretation. Nod Moshinung, we Jushinung, Kinegego, S Chigayung, Nigan, Nekea, Pane, Wewene, Miguetch, Miu. And what that means is help us, be with us in all that we do into the future always. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Naomi, miigwech. All right, so hello again, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Natasha Bazega and I am the St. Clair River Remedial Action Plan Coordinator at the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority. And as part of my role, I liaise with stakeholders and engage the public in all things related to the St. Clair River area of concern and the Remedial Action Plan. 
Recognizing that it's likely that not everyone here today will be familiar with the program, I'll be providing a short 101 presentation to introduce you to areas of concern as a whole. Uh, this program has a long history and is a little complex, but I've tried to simplify things so not to take up too much time this evening. So as I'm sure most of you are aware, there's a very long history with oil refining and chemical production along both shores of the St. Clair River due to the discovery and commercialization of oil. The availability of jobs and resources ultimately led to the urban development of the area, but it also came at a cost to the environment. So in 1987, the governments of Canada and the United States recognized the St. Clair River as one of 43 severely degraded sites around the Great Lakes as a result of human activities. These areas are identified as areas of concern or AOCs for short. Of the 43 areas of concern, 12 were located in Canada, 26 were located in the US, and five were binational, meaning they were a shared responsibility between the two countries. This map shows the locations of only the Canadian and binational areas of concern, but you'll notice that several AOCs align with major cities around the Great Lakes, where there is significant natural resource, industrial, and urban development in the early 1900s. The purple diamonds on this map, I hope you can see them, uh, those indicate where the binational or shared er areas of concern are located. And one of those is the St. Clair River. The circles, stars, and triangles all indicate the solely Canadian areas of concern differentiated by their recovery status. Without getting into too much detail on those, the stars indicate locations where the area of concerns uh, have been delisted, which is the ultimate goal of all areas of concern. And to be delisted means that all the restoration activities have taken place and that the condition of the water body is comparable to other Great Lakes sites that are not considered uh, areas of concern. So to date, three Canadian AOCs have been delisted. Uh, the boundary of the St. Clair River area of concern stretches the entire 64 kilometer length of the river, which extends from the Blue Water Bridge at Point Edward down to Mitchell's Bay. It is part of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway as it is part of the connecting channel between Lake Huron and Lake Erie. So it plays an important role in the shipping and navigation as well as the Canadian economy. There are two First Nation communities that call the St. Clair River home. Those are Amgenong First Nation located just south of Sarnia and Walpole Island First Nation in the Delta where the St. Clair River meets Lake St. Clair. The entire stretch of the river borders the United States and is therefore impacted by the activities that occur along both shores. So now that we know what and where the St. Clair River area of concern is, uh, I'm next I'm just going to talk a little bit about the plan to remediate the river and some of the work that's been completed to date. So all areas of concern have one or more environmental challenges to address. Uh, at the time when areas of concern were first identified, each location, each location was assessed based on 14 beneficial use impairments or BUIs. These were defined as reductions in the chemical, physical, or biological integrity of the waters of the Great Lakes. Uh, the 14 BUIs are listed in the table on the right and include things like restrictions on drinking water consumption, uh, degraded aesthetics, and impacts to fish and wildlife populations or habitat, just to give you an idea. In each area of concern, each BUI is evaluated and given a status of either impaired, meaning they do not meet specific quality objectives, or not impaired, meaning that the quality is satisfactory. In instances where there was insufficient data to identify if the BUI was impaired or not impaired, they were deemed uh, requiring further assessment. In order to delist or remove an area of concern, each of the impaired BUIs needs to be addressed and the actions to restore BUIs have been identified in unique remedial action plans. So remedial action plans are essentially a cleanup plan to address the impaired BUIs. And these are locally developed plans that address the 80 plus years of pollution that the area of concern has experienced. It's important to note that the goal of these remedial action plans is to address the historical consequences of industrial and urban development and restore the aquatic environment in those areas of concern. So they're consistent with quality and other non AOC sites around the Great Lakes. And while there are new concerns impacting our waterways today, like microplastics and impacts of climate change, the remedial action plans solely focus on those legacy issues. Not to say that the new concerns aren't important, but they just, they are addressed through other programs and they, they weren't really factors in the designation of areas of concern when they were first identified over 30 years ago. So as you can appreciate, restoration of these areas of concern isn't easy and has been managed in stages. And the first stage, the sources and extent of the environmental degradation were identified. Uh, and for the St. Clair River, a report documenting those problems and sources was completed in, a, in 1991, as common, commonly referred to as the stage one report. And then in the second stage, the restoration goals or BUI delisting criteria 
were developed. And, and these BUI delisting criteria stipulate the conditions that must be met in order for the BUI status to be changed from impaired to not impaired. So these were the, the restoration yardsticks, and they were all summarized in a stage two report, which was published in 1995. Now, 1995 was a while ago. I was barely even born. But since that time, actions have continued to be taken to move restoration forward and, uh, and restore those BUIs. So in the St. Clair River of area of concern, the coordination and implementation of the plan here, uh, here in Canada is the responsibility of the Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implement Implementation Committee. Sorry, it's a mouthful. Uh, and we commonly refer to that committee as the CRIC. So the CRIC is a diverse committee that has representation from all levels of government, industry, conservation organizations, Omtenong and Walpole Island First Nations, as well as the public. Members bring their expertise and resources, and they collaborate to continue working towards the common goal of delisting the area of concern. And given that the St. Clair River is a binational area of concern, the state of Michigan also has their own plan to address BUIs on the opposite shore of the river. And a binational public advisory council called the BPAC meets regularly to discuss activities happening in the area of concern as a whole and to maintain a strong working relationship and open communication between the Canadian and American portions of the area of concern. Now, both countries have taken different approaches, uh, but we are working towards the common goal of delisting the AOC and uh, ultimately restoring the river is, a, is for everyone's benefit. So since 1991, there's been really great progress made in restoring the St. Clair River. Um, I've included this graphic because I think it's the most straightforward and simple way of showing the progress that has been made. Any of the red icons indicate an impaired status, green icons are not impaired, and yellow require further assessment. So looking at the balance beam on the left, you can see that at the time that the river was identified as an area of concern, only two BUIs were deemed not impaired. So things weren't great. Uh, fortunately, after 30 years of effort, we can see in the balance beam on the right that the weight has shifted and we now have significantly fewer impairments and the condition of the river has improved. Really quickly, I just wanted to show this table that shows the status of BUIs in both Canada and the US. Uh, they do differ slightly. And as I said, both countries have taken their own approach to restoring areas of concern. Uh, and so while we have four impaired BUIs and one requiring further assessment here in Canada, the US only has two impaired BUIs, but those two, two impaired BUIs uh, do align with the ones that we have here in Canada. Now, without getting into too much detail, I do want to highlight some of the projects that have been completed to date uh, or that are ongoing that have contributed to the progress made here in the St. Clair River area of concern. Uh, so first, significant financial investment has been made to upgrade municipal infrastructure. Uh, these upgrades included uh, improved treatment processes at wastewater treatment facilities, the separation of combined sewers, uh, and improved sewer flow management. And these upgrades have greatly improved the water quality and aesthetics in the St. Clair River. A number of diverse fish and wildlife studies have been conducted in and along the St. Clair River. I know April will talk in detail about some more of these studies in her presentation, but as an example, one study looked at the prevalence of liver tumors in brown bullhead catfish around Walpole Island First Nation, and 60 fish were collected and they found zero liver tumors. So these results, or uh, the results of this study supported the advancement of BUI number four, which is fish tumors and other deformities. And that BUI was actually redesignated earlier this year in June. So that's uh, very exciting. Um, on this slide, you'll see some of the habitat restoration and creation projects that have been completed to date. About 280 projects have been completed to improve fish and wildlife habitat, uh, which is another BUI. Many of those projects would not have been possible without the support of local landowners. So we're super grateful and very lucky to have their support. Uh, one last example is the management of contaminated sediment. So throughout this summer, a series of community presentations were made to provide an update on the engineering and design plan to address mercury contaminated sediments in three remaining areas of the St. Clair River. Addressing contaminated sediments is one of the key priorities remaining for the advancement of uh, two different BUIs. And this project does have its own website. So if you are looking for more information, I do encourage you to go to stclairsediment.ca. So as you can imagine, the focus is now on addressing these remaining beneficial use impairments. And those include restrictions on drinking water consumption, which we actually featured as part of our uh, first information session back in April. Um, degraded fish and wildlife habitat is another 
degra degradation of benthos is another, and then the restrictions on fish and wildlife consumption. And then R1 RFA BUI here in the St. Clair River AOC is a degradation of fish and wildlife populations, which is our feature presentation for this evening. So without further ado, I would like to pass the mic over to tonight's feature presenter. So please help me welcome April White, Great Lakes Area of Concern Program Officer with Environment and Climate Change Canada and co-chair of the Canadian ROP Implementation Committee. Welcome, April. Sorry, April, I'm not sure if you're if you're talking, but I can't hear you. Okay. Thanks, Natasha. Yep. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was talking. I was <laughs> talking. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you again for joining us tonight. As Natasha said, my name is April White and I work for Environment and Climate Change Canada, or ECC for short. And I am the rep on the uh, on the crick. As you saw in Natasha's presentation, the degradation of uh, fish and wildlife populations is the BUI, uh, the only BUI that's remaining where we uh, do not have a, a definite status as either impaired or not impaired. It was the one on the balance beam that was yellow that kind of sat in the minute in the middle. It was neither impaired or impaired. So tonight, um, I hope to walk you through some information that was shared with the CRIC that form really the, the basis for a not impaired uh, status. As you'll learn during the through the presentation, the not impaired status recommendation is based on long-term surveys and monitoring data, specific wildlife studies, some fish studies, as well as local um, indigenous expert knowledge. I don't know if I have control there to advance the next slide. And no, nope, I can't see. All right, April, I'll have to, to advance them for you, but I, I have your second slide up. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so as Natasha identified, there are 14 BUIs and Again, tonight's uh, presentation will focus on BUI3. Um, and I'm often gonna refer to it as BUI3 because as you can appreciate, the title is quite long, Degradation of Fish and Wildlife Population. So it's easier for me to refer to it as BUI3. Next slide. So to facilitate decisions around the status of BUIs, you might be wondering how decisions are made. And essentially there's guidance provided to committees like the CRIC to consider when determining the status. And this slide shows the guidance that was provided for BY3. And as you can see on the left, um, it identifies when uh, a team could consider the BUI as impaired, meaning if there was effects uh, from contaminants in the water or sediment that was sufficient to negatively affect growth and reproduction of fish and wildlife. Or on the flip side, it could could be considered not impaired when populations are diverse, abundant, abundant and growth and reproduction in fish and wildlife is not adversely impacted by uh, contaminants in the sediment or water. While the guidance is brief, it really did provide RAP teams uh, with direction on what the BUI should assess. Next slide. So this slide is busy, but I just wanted to show a little bit of context for the work that, that has been done to support the assessment of this BOI. So I'm just gonna talk quickly about the history, which Natasha already uh, kind of covered kind of briefly, but I'll just recap. So in 1987, the stage one report described the environmental conditions within the St. Clair River AOC, as well as the issues associated with each BOI. And in this report, fish populations were described as diverse and well-balanced. So there was really no issue about abundance or diversity. But it did articulate concern for industrial contaminants such, a, such as hexachlorobenzene, octachlorostyrene, polychlorinated biphenyls, and metals like mercury. As these were accumulating in the tissue of some juvenile fish, as well as aquatic wildlife. The report also noted 
a decline of four specific waterfowl species between 1968 and 1982. And at the time the stage one report was written, there was really not a, a strong understanding about the effects of contaminants on uh, growth and reproduction in, in fish and wildlife. And so this BY was deemed to require further assessment. To address the concerns raised in the stage one report, the stage two made a series of recommendations both to address the impaired BUIs as well as those that were deemed as requiring further assessment like BUI3. The recommendations included evaluating long-term data on waterfowl and marsh birds and continued monitoring of fish and wildlife contaminant levels to assess change over time and facilitate comparisons over time between the AOC and those outside the AOC. I'm pleased to say that all of these recommendations have been met and were completed. Following the stage two, there were periodic update reports, and these really were critical because they provided the RAP teams with new information on BUIs. And so, for example, in the 1997 update report, there was a study on waterfowl and amphibian populations within the St. Clair River AOC that suggested populations were really not different to populations outside the AOC, and that contaminant levels in waterfowl and turtle eggs had declined, suggesting conditions were improving in the AOC as a result of remedial measures. Following um, the two update reports followed um, in 2006 and 2009, and basically both reiterated the importance of continuing monitoring on body burdens and um, to facilitate kind of, again, assessing change over time and to use uh, scientific thresholds that were designed to evaluate effects of contaminants on fish and wildlife health. The collection of these reports really provided the CRIC and other teams with valuable information and direction on assessing these BUIs. Following the 2009 update report, ECC conducted several comprehensive studies on aquatic wildlife to assess the effects of contaminants on growth and reproduction to essentially evaluate the status of the BUI called burden animal deformities or reproduction problems, which is obviously very closely linked to BUI3, which is about populations. The results of these indi studies indicated that contaminant burdens in frogs and turtles that were studied were not adversely impacted, um, and these species were able to grow and reproduce effectively. So the status of the BUI was changed in 2008 as indicated on the timeline based on the reports. And you'll see on the timeline, I've put a little star um, beside that report. However, as the name suggests, it only addressed uh, the effects of contaminants on growth and reproduction for birds or animals and not fish. And so we'll get hold that thought because we're gonna get to that later. And today, You'll see thumbnail images of various reports that have been uh, drafted in response to some of the recommendations made in the stage two report. And ultimately these reports provide the foundation for the CRICS not impaired status recommendation for this BOI. Next slide. So this is just recapping kind of the findings of the stage one. And for those, um, and I, and I really just wanted to highlight kind of the contaminants of concern. So there they're listed. Hexachlorobenzene, octochlorostyrene, PCBs, so polychlorinated biphenyls and mercury. Um, the stage two was really the report that um, identified recommendations to address the concerns of stage one and then subsequent reports like the 2006 and nine update reports really did provide more current information. And again, the uh, studies that have been completed in support of other BUIs um, have, and, and reports that have been developed in response to the recommendations of the stage two really do provide the foundation for the status of, uh, uh, of this BUI as being recommended as now impaired. Next slide. And what these reports also did was really hone in on uh, what questions do we really need to answer for when we talk about fish and wildlife populations, what is the assessment really gonna try and address? So for fish, 
um, it was pretty evident that we really needed to assess the potential effects of contaminants on fish populations, meaning can they successfully grow and reproduce? And then to assess whether or not contaminant levels that were detected in, and identified in the stage one report, have they declined and, and where possible, how do they um, compare to scientific guidelines around fish health? For wildlife, uh, the questions are quite similar. However, uh, the potential effects on contaminants in wildlife were really assessed under BUI-5. And that, the studies for that BUI really did determine um, that aquatic wildlife like frogs and turtles that were studied could, could grow and reproduce and ultimately be self-sustaining. So the focus of the assessment for BUI-3 is on abundance and diversity of wildlife within the AOC compared to outside the AOC. And like fish, to uh, compare contaminant levels from the early years to what they are now and compare them to relevant scientific guidelines associated with health. Next slide. So let's start with fish. So here are um, some thumbnail images of, um, that uh, are really reports that were used to inform um, the decision to recommend the status of this BOI is not impaired. And these uh, studies were really led by uh, Environment and Climate, Climate Change Canada. Next slide. So because we didn't know the effects of contaminants on, on fish growth and reproduction, in 2014, ECC launched a, a study. And the study uh, is described here on the slide, on the right-hand side. It, it collected body measurements of three species of fish from different locations in the river, as well as Lake Huron, which is an, a reference site, meaning it's, uh, it's outside of the AOC and was not impacted by um, uh, kind of the, the development or the industrial and urban development that the river was, uh, had experienced. So this was our, our reference site and fish were collected from these locations. Next slide. So although the study sampled three species of fish, in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on the results of the one fish that was studied, and it's the shorthead red horse sucker. And it was a, an indicator fish for um, a, another BUI um, called fish tumors and other deformities. This is a bottom feeding fish. It is site faithful, meaning it doesn't really migrate far. And uh, so it's not transitory like other fish, and it's a really good indicator of the aquatic environment. So, like I said, this was the this was a species used to help assess BUI four, um, and it BUI four just ironically was also another RFA BUI that was uh, just recently, as Natasha said, designated as not impaired. So I'm just going to focus on the studies of this fish. Um, in the presentation, um, just to highlight what some of the findings were. So this table is kind of busy, but it, it did, it's intended to summarize some of the measurements of the fish that were sampled in both the St. Clair River and Lake Huron. And I'm just going to draw your attention to the green shaded areas to highlight some results. The first highlighted row summarizes what is called a condition index, which is a way to measure overall health of a fish by comparing its weight uh, to other fish from other locations of the same length. Between the two sites, so the, Saint, the fish that were collected from the St. Clair River and those that were collected in Lake Huron, the um, researchers did not see any significant differences in the body condition between the two sites. In the lower shaded area or the lower uh, shaded row, um, the weight of the reproductive organs of fish were, were also sampled and weighed from each site. And again, there was no significant differences found between the AOC, uh, the fish collected from within the AOC compared to those from Lake Huron. And the last two shaded box highlights the number of eggs per female um, fish had between the two sites. And again, there was no significant differences found. 
If the conditions in the river were highly de degraded, we'd expect to see differences in these measurements between the sites, but this was not the case. So the fact that there was no uh, differences in these me measurements suggests that the conditions in the St. Clair River are not adversely impacting growth or the reproductive capacity of fish from within the river. Next slide. Researchers also looked at um, deformities, fin erosion, lumps, and lesions on organs as another way to kind of measure condition. The fish were visually uh, inspected and the study found that the condition of the fish collected from within the river, uh, the St. Clair River that is, uh, were no different from those collected from Lake Huron. Next slide. With respect to um, contaminant burdens, I'll start with metals. Um, this table is just a sample of some of the metals that were included in the analysis. And because mercury is of particular interest, it's highlighted here. I'm just gonna point out that this survey, um, I'm just gonna point out that this, uh, this table summarizes differences between fish caught from 2002 and three when uh, some sampling was last done by ECC um, to 2014 when this study was conducted. But it's important to mention that there were significant declines between 1970 and 2000 approximately in mercury levels across the Great Lakes um, as a result of point source control and um, other regulatory and voluntary measures. A significant decline in mercury was also documented in the St. Clair. But um, as this slide indicates, there was some change um, in, in the metals. And for the most part, you can see arrows are pointing downward, which is the trend. So there, it's a decreasing trend in some of these metals. And mercury is uh, included. When there's no arrow, it just means that there was really no significant change or it, it has stabilized. So really this study was just an opportunity to um, see what changes have occurred more recently. I'll also point out that as the, uh, as the table suggests, the numbers are really the fold in uh, concentration change, which is uh, important to note. And while the study was conducted in 14, it really is just a snapshot in time. But when you look at it over time, when you compare it to previous years, it does give a pretty compelling story that remediation uh, measures in the St. Clair uh, River have been successful in lowering um, body burdens in, in fish. Next slide. And the same was found for some of the uh, industrial related contaminants, the PCB, uh, or sorry, hexachlorobenzene, octachlorostyrene, as well as PCBs. So again, um, you will see that the arrows are generally pointing down, downward, which, which is good news. If you have real clever and quick eyes, you will notice that there is an increase at Stag Island and hexachlorobutadiene. And at the, we really can't explain this um, increase, um, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention because it, 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 the arrows are pointing up and it's, uh, it's obviously an increase from 2002 levels. Next slide. So one of the recommendations in this stage two was to compare these contaminant uh, levels to kind of scientific guidelines around that are associated with, with health. And this um, slide depicts the body burdens um, of the fish in the red horse, of the red horse sucker and compares them to those scientific guidelines. And the one of most interest is the one that's associated with the protection of fish health, which is the dotted line. And so looking at mercury, you can see that between 2003 and 14, um, in 2003, which is the, the chart on the right, there was locations that were above the guideline, whereas in 2014, uh, all sites were either at or below the threshold, suggesting again, there's been improvements 
and that while bur body burdens remain, um, they are below levels associated with adverse effects on fish health. Next slide. So we come back to the questions, the initial questions, what does this assessment need to um, address? What are the questions that we need to ask? And so one, the question of, can they successfully grow and reproduce? Um, based on the, the fish health study, um, and again, I'm just talking about red horse sucker, but it does apply to the other. The study concluded that most of the measured um, metals and contaminants of concern in the tissue of fish had decreased between the 2002 and 14, and that mercury levels were either at or below the guidelines associated with the protection of fish health, indicating that there was an overall improvement in tissue concentrations for fish. So we've satisfied um, those questions. And it's also intuitive that in the stage one report, there was really no concern about the abundance of and diversity of fish. But this study really uh, tried to look deeper into um, the issue of contaminants within the river, as we know that that's really a concern for the local community. And again, the results suggest that there is really no um, adverse effects on growth and reproduction for fish. So switching gears to wildlife, and again, there's just some thumbnail um, images of some reports that uh, are highlighted um, in this presentation and that were used to really form the foundation for a not impaired status recommendation. The first three, um, starting from the top, when we're working our way down, the first three thumbnail images really address uh, abundance and diversity of waterfowl, marsh birds, and amphibians. And the last one summarizes wildlife contaminant burdens. And this, um, this report was written by ECC and it does summarize um, pretty much all of the studies that were conducted within the AOC um, pertaining to, to wildlife and body burdens. I'll just say four wildlife, five long-term uh, wildlife data sets were uh, were utilized in the assessment, and the sources include uh, the Atlas of Breeding Birds for Ontario, uh, harvest levels from the Ministry of Natural Resources, Marsh Bird and Amphibian Monitoring um, Survey from both Environment Canada and Bird Studies Canada, and of course, ECC's waterfowl uh, surveys and Environment Canada's um, Marsh Bird Monitoring Surveys. So for wildlife, again, key questions for the assessment, uh, like fish, can they grow and reproduce normally? What's the abundance and diversity like in the AOC compared to outside and have contaminant levels uh, decreased over time? Because again, we've answered kind of the first question uh, under another BUI, the focus of the assessment really was on answering questions two and three. Next slide. So in 2011 and 12, ECC contracted Bird Studies Canada to compile and analyze all the long-term data sets uh, that were suggested in the stage two report to assess whether the wildlife communities within the AOC were comparable to uh, communities outside the AOC. And if they were, this would suggest there's no impairment to this BUI. So using very complicated statistical methods, BSC set out uh, to test whether wildlife was significantly better or worse um, in the AOC than outside the AOC. For the purpose of assessment, we were dreaming big and wildlife refers to marsh birds, waterfowl, amphibians, and aquatic mammals. So this is uh, quite comprehensive. So um, we focus really on just a, a selection of metrics that are listed on this slide. So for example, for marsh birds, we didn't look at all marsh birds, we just looked at those that uh, kind of rely on marshes for nesting. And for waterfowl, we really looked at um, maybe four species as well as uh, the guilds like divers and dabblers and so on. Next slide. 
So focusing really on trends, because that's really what it's about. It, our conditions getting better, our remedial actions working. Um, we made use of the long-term data sets. And so uh, focusing on that, um, and given the context of, of the task at hand, we wanted to really assess whether or not um, there was an increasing trend of diversity and abundance inside the AOC compared to outside the AOC. As again, this would suggest no impairment. And conversely, if wildlife diversity and abundance trends were decreasing in the AOC more steeply or more than outside the AOC, it would suggest an impairment. It's a bit of a mind bender, but it does uh, make sense. And certainly in the draft report that will be available, it's, it's well explained. Next slide. So the results and starting with waterfowl. For waterfowl, the Birth Studies Canada evaluated the Environment and Climate Change Canada waterfowl surveys. Uh, which is data collected by ECC approximately every 10 years. The aim of the waterfowl surveys is to understand the abundance and distribution of waterfowl across the Great Lakes and to monitor trends looking at the use of major marsh complexes around the Great Lakes by waterfowl. The surveys, the surveys are conducted visually by waterfowl biologists in a plane who record the abundance and species that they see below. ECC calculates a kind of quote unquote waterfowl use day. It's a as a estimate of overall abundance. So for waterfowl, uh, BSC looked at uh, the data and compared, um, compared sector 16, which is the pink area outlined in the AOC to six other um, sectors that are also surveyed for waterfowl that were of comparable uh, wetland, like of, of comparable um, composition. These wetlands were located uh, on Lake St. Clair as well as on uh, Lake Erie. And again, the idea was just to get um, a sense of whether or not the um, diversity and abundance within the AOC is comparable to these other sites outside the AOC. And as you can see in the chart, uh, the highlighted sections, um, looking at total species, so the total abundance, the AOC trend is uh, positive in the spring. And it's similar to the regional trend. The regional trend is also positive with the exception of dabblers. And can, looking lower in the fall, the trends are identical in the AOC, as well as these areas that were uh, investigated outside the AOC. So having uh, similar or better trends uh, would suggest that there's no impairment within the AOC for waterfowl. Next slide. The AOC has been surveyed a total of six times, three of which have been since the stage one report. And these waterfowl surveys cover spring and fall seasons. And so as you can see over time there in the spring and in the fall, while there has been variation, there has been significant increases um, in some years, including 2003. But generally the, the area is still very well used. And you can see from the number of um, birds with the exception of perhaps one year, in the fall, the use is, is very similar. So the, the abundance between the fall and spring have been pretty similar um, within the AOC or, or very consistent. And one elder described the abundance of waterfowls being um, so thick, the sky was black with ducks and that uh, it blocked the sun. And that, um, that traditional knowledge really coincides well with the, with the data, particularly from the 1960s and 70s. Next slide. In 2009-11, that was the most recent um, waterfowl survey and uh, ECC hired um, uh, a consultant, well, uh, someone to just analyze this data and come up with um, 
um, the abundance. And as you can see from the map, both areas um, in the spring and in the fall are still supporting, you know, literally millions of waterfowl each year. And the AOC is really comparable to uh, Point Pelee and Long Point, both of which are outside the OC and on Lake Erie. Next slide. So you might be wondering what happened to those four ducks that were identified in the stage one as uh, having a significant decline. Um, subsequent surveys showed that the, the ducks rebounded, but then um, uh, did not fully recover. And waterfowl biologists uh, suspect that because these birds are um, not highly adaptable and can be um, um, kind of shy or whatever, or just or be subject to disturbance, they probably just relocated to um, other areas. Um, things like water level um, also um, re reduce their food supply and, um, and that too might have been a factor, but they suspect it was not as a result of the conditions within the AOC, as the AOC is still supporting significant waterfowl uh, use. Moving on to marsh birds. Um, so since 2007, ECC uh, has been monitoring marsh birds with insects wetlands of the AOC. Those are indicated in the blue bar as well as outside the AOC indicated in the yellow bar. And this is depicting kind of the average uh, condition of the marsh bird community in each of the years that the monitoring has been completed. And as you can see, the condition of the marsh bird community um, is above the line associated with good. It also suggests that there's really no significant difference between the community within the AOC compared to outside the AOC, such as those on Lake St. Clair. Next slide. With respect to amphibians, the data was a little um, uh, thin. It is collected by volunteers who listen to frog calls at, on specified routes during specific um, times of year. And using this data, which is really the best available, the um, AOC community, as you can see here, is considered fair. However, you'll note that the richness within the AOC is, um, is better than what is considered outside of the AOC. Knowing that the uh, amphibian data was a little thin, ECC deployed um, recording units out in uh, wetlands within the AOC, and the results revealed that six different frog species calls were recorded within the AOC compared to four outside the AOC. So suggesting that um, certainly in terms of richness, um, the the fact that we are more rich than outside the AOC seems to hold true. Indigenous knowledge holders from Walpole Island also commented that frogs were deafening or that, and as well as uh, several bull frogs uh, could be caught in a relatively short period of time, which also um, supported kind of a, a high abundance and high diversity um, for amphibians within the AOC. Some members did raised concern that numbers were declining, while others uh, attributed this to just a change in habitat within the community. Next slide. For muskrats, and we are getting near the end, um, the MNR manages kind of harvest limits for small fur bears like muskrats. And so we use the harvesting um, data to kind of plot uh, would it look like kind of in areas adjacent to the AOC um, compared to areas that were or counties that were surrounding the AOC. So the um, area adjacent to the AOC is represented by that hard line and the counties that are um, outside of the AOC are the dashed lines. And so you can see that uh, harvest limits or harvesting is higher in areas adjacent to the AOC versus those that are not. And so um, that seems to suggest that uh, there is good habitat and high abundance of these species um, adjacent or in the AOC. 
Traditional knowledge was also helpful uh, with this data as uh, Wapol Island knowledge holders uh, shared that um, waterfowl, or sorry, muskrat uh, was still abundant within the, within the Delta, but did caution they, they can be affected by water levels and predation, um, both of which are um, kind of beyond the scope for us, for the RAP to address, but um, other areas would also be subject to the same kind of um, factors. Next slide. So in terms of wildlife diversity and abundance, uh, this is just a quick visual of what the findings um, reveal. Next slide. And lastly, for uh, contaminant burdens of wildlife, um, this slide really just tries to summarize some of some of the findings. As I said, there is a report and that is thumbnail. As you can see on the slide there, it's a thumbnail at the cover page. Um, but it does try to summarize some of the information regarding um, mercury levels in ducks that overwintered in the AOC, which was a recommendation from the stage two. So if I start at the top, um, we have kind of average concentrations of mercury in the livers of um, ducks that were collected from within the AOC that actually overwintered in the AOC and compared them to two uh, thresholds, one for reproduction and one for survival. And you can see that the levels of mercury within the livers of the ducks collected within the AOC are well below those, um, those concentrations. The second um, chart is really a summary of the industrial related um, contaminants. And what I have circled is really just the significant decline in, in things like PCBs, um, hexachlora, benzene, and octochlorostyrene. So what this shows is that uh, while fish and wildlife still have burdens, the, the levels have dramatically declined and, and uh, they are not near um, guidelines associated with either reproduction, um, adverse effects, or, or survival. And just like fish, we've summarized, uh, did we answer our questions? And the kind of feeling is, yes, we did. And so is abundance and diversity in the OC consistent with the area outside based on what we can uh, put together using the best available uh, data? Yes. Um, have contaminant levels decreased? Um, the answer is yes. While they still exist, there has been significant declines in PCBs, so CS, um, HCB, and mercury. And um, although they, yeah, as I said, although they persist, they are below uh, known thresholds associated with adverse effects on growth and reproduction and survival in the ducks that were studied um, within the AOC. So based on that, the Crick, uh, the Crick is recommending a not impaired uh, status for this BUI. And um, a report summarizing the findings. And again, this is kind of a, a monster BUI to cover in a short period of time, but there is going to be a report. It's, it's under review at the moment, but it will be made publicly available. And for those that registered, we can certainly um, share that report once it is available. The resources that were used to kind of uh, draft the report are available on the AOC web, uh, website. And that is it for me. I will pass Great. it. <laughs> Thank you, April. <laughs> that is, uh, that's a lot of information you've squeezed into a short period of time, but I thought it was great. Um, we are running pretty close to eight, but given that, um, you know, talking to our expert panel is, is going to be a, an important part of the evening, I'm going to ask, or I'm going to, as long as our panel is okay, if we push our session back to 810, just to allow for a full 10 minutes of questions. Uh, if you have any concerns, please let me know now. Awesome. Okay, so I'm confident that this presentation will inspire some great community questions. So if anyone does have a question, uh, I encourage you to um, please submit it through their Q&A feature at this time. And while you're submitting those questions, uh, I'm going to take a quick minute to properly introduce tonight's panelists. 
So first, I'll give a proper introduction to April White, who works for Environment and Climate Change Canada, and for the past 10 years has been the federal lead for the St. Clair and Detroit River areas of concern. And in her role, April coordinates the necessary scientific and financial resources to support implementation of the RAP. Uh, next, we have Joe Fiorino, who is a habitat ecologist with Environment and Climate Change Canada, Canadian Wildlife Service, and has been instrumental in the monitoring of wetland health within the St. Clair River area of concern. And our third panelist this evening is Shane DeSola, and Shane is an ecotoxicologist with Environment and Co Climate Change Canada in the Science and Technology Branches Wildlife Toxicology Research Section. Shane led and was instrumental in the design of the studies to assess the effects of contaminants of aquatic wildlife within the St. Clair River. St. Clair River area of concern. So welcome panelists. Now in the sake of time and to respect everyone's schedule this evening, I know we're running late, uh, I'm gonna dive right into the questions. So just a reminder to our audience that if we don't get to your question this evening, I will get responses to all questions and make them available on the symposium webpage in the near future. Uh, so I'll just read the questions as written. And if any of you, any of our panelists would like to answer, uh, you can, uh, turn your mic on and respond. You can also turn on your video if you'd like at this time. Okay, so our first question is, uh, what are some of the most common marsh birds in the wetlands of the St. Clair River area of concern? Hi everybody, I can, I can take that one. Uh, so, <clears throat> I'd say the probably the most common uh, marsh birds we get during surveys are red-winged blackbird and common yellowthroat. Uh, but those are considered generalists, meaning they use a variety of habitats, including marshes. Um, so we're often more interested in species that exclusively use marshes because they, they, they have nowhere else to go. And of those species, uh, swamp sparrow is, is probably the most common one. To make things slightly more complicated, we also have a suite of species that are of particular conservation concern. And from that list, uh, the most common ones would be marsh wren and pied-billed grebe. And when we see those uh, at, a, at a given wetland, we would typically, uh, we would typically think it's in, in, in pretty good condition. Great, thank you. Uh, and our next question is, does fluctuating water levels influence marsh bird communities? It's probably going to be me again. Uh, so I, I think the short answer is absolutely. Um, so within a given year, uh, water levels tend to rise until mid-summer-ish. Uh, if the water rises too quickly during the breeding season, that can be problematic. Uh, it can cause uh, nest flooding, which can lead to abandonment of, of, of nests. Uh, there are also obviously fluctuations from year to year and potentially over many years. Um, which is something we've obviously seen a lot recently. Uh, those changes in water levels ultimately influence the habitat for marsh birds. So uh, just as an example, uh, in high water periods, emergent plants uh, that form dense stands, like uh, thinking of the like, cattails and phragmites, uh, they become flooded and some of them even die off and that will, will provide better uh, nesting habitat for many marsh birds. Um, but there's a limit to that. So if the water levels continue to rise, uh, eventually the marsh will get flooded out. So water levels then need to decline to maintain that, that good quality habitat. Um, on the flip side, if water levels are always constant, uh, you would likely see like an expansion of that dense emergent vegetation. So it really is, it really is that balance between high and low periods of high and low water levels over different periods of time. Um, that give us the best, the most diverse habitat that's best for marsh birds. Great, thank you. I believe this next question is for Shane. Um, can you explain why the variability in mercury concentrations in frogs, oh, sorry, can you explain the variability in mercury concentrations in frogs and turtle eggs? Um, sort of, it's actually a, relatively hard question. First of all, there's many types of mercury. Uh, the two main types is elemental mercury, and then there's methylmercury or other forms of organic mercury. The elemental form of mercury is actually not particularly biocumulative. The methylmercury, however, uh, tends to be a lot more biocumulative. Now, when it comes to elemental mercury, there's both natural sources. It's naturally found in, in rocks, and therefore you tend to find it in soils and sediments and that sort of thing. But we also release it in sewage treatment plants, or it gets emitted from landfills and things like that. Uh, methylmercury 
is primarily um, sort of a natural compound. It's basically is formed from uh, you know a bacterial uh, anaerobic bacteria in sediment, causing it to be um, changed from the elemental form of mercury to um, a methylated or ethylated uh, form of mercury. So it's a bit complex in terms of where you actually find mercury. I mean, most people think you find lots of mercury in highly industrial areas, but Hamilton Harbor is actually fairly low. If you go up to up north in some of these oligotrophic lakes, there's no industry and yet you get high levels of mercury. So it's kind of hard to figure out uh, necessarily why the levels are pretty high. But anyway, to answer closer to the question, um, it is a bit complex because of the complexity of the St. Clair area. For example, in Walpole, you have both the river going through it, but you also have these inland uh, wetlands and dikes. And so you actually get different levels of mercury or formation of methylmercury in the inland uh, coastal wetlands versus the actual uh, in river. And the thing is about these turtles and these uh, frogs is that they can move from one to the other. So if they spend 100% of the time inland versus 100% of the time in the river or 50% inland versus 50% in the water and so on and so forth, they can uh, end up having different levels of mercury. The level of variability that you actually see in, in this area is not really that unusual. You tend to see some variability uh, no matter where you go. So um, I can't tell you why this turtle versus that turtle will have high levels of, of mercury, but you, it, it will depend on how much mercury is actually in organic form, how much is it is being methylated because of bacteria in the sediment, and how much is it in, in the diet. I'm not sure if that points, quite answers your question, but it's actually a fairly surprisingly complex one to try to answer. Well, we appreciate you trying. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. Uh, I do have one more question for you, Shane. Um, what is what is a PCB, the sources, and do they stay in the environment forever? Um, PCB stands for polychlorinated biphenyls. They were first manufactured um, back in about 1903 or so, but they weren't commercially made until about 1930s when Monsanto bought your rights to the chemical. They were produced in North America up until 1977, um, but I mean, a lot of people think that that's when production ended, 1977. That's not really true. It stopped in the United States, 1977, but PCBs were produced for up until the 1990s in places like Russia and other countries like that. In any case, PCBs, um, they are uh, flame retardants primarily. Uh, you often use them in transformers, you know, those little trash can looking things that buy um, power lines. They often had high levels of PCBs up until the late 1970s. Uh, sorry, that's not quite. They're manufactured in transformers up in 1977, but we didn't stop using them. So we stopped producing PCBs, but we kept using them for another few decades. Uh, they've also been used in hydraulic fluids, uh, in paints, and in caulking. And so they slowly reached an environment um, after we stopped manufacturing. So uh, the, the sources haven't actually completely disappeared. Uh, the other thing is that they're very persistent. Now, are they going to live forever? No, they, they do degrade, but the half-lives in sediment, uh, depending on, on what type of PCBs, there are 209 types of PCBs, depending on the amount of chlorination. It will vary from a few years up to literally decades. The half-life in humans ranges from about weeks to a little over a decade. So the concentrations have been going down, but they're going to be here for a really long time before they're completely gone. I mean, none of us are going to be around by the time PCBs are gone. Uh, it's going to last that long. But the levels have been declining, although the rate decline seems to have been leveling off a fair bit. Okay. Um, and I guess this is a question maybe for each of you, but what can we do as individuals to support marsh birds? Probably more... I can jump back in on that one. Uh, sorry, so it's what we can do to support marsh birds? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like a simple question, but I think it is a little bit tricky. Um, and, and really, I guess I don't have a, I don't have a full appreciation for everything that is happening in the AOC, whether it's, whether it's good or bad. Um, that being said, I think, I think, I think one thing that applies probably pretty generally is that it's important to be aware of the timing of the breeding season and making sure to avoid disturbing birds at that time. So that can apply to uh, construction projects that are happening near a marsh or, or to a manager of a, of a hunt club that's considering a water level drawdown or any, or any other number of things. Um, another thing you can do is 
help gather information on March, on March birds uh, so that we can keep track of populations over time. Uh, that could be as simple as as using eBird on your on your phone or on your computer to keep track of the birds that you that you find or run into, um, or something a little more structured like potentially getting involved in one of uh, Bird Canada's Birds Canada's many uh, community science programs. So things I think things like that would, would could go a long way. Uh, just a very very minor point. Uh, I live in Niagara region, so it's probably quite a bit different than where most people here are actually living, but. I noticed in the, my local area, a lot of people have ponds and some people that let their ponds just sort of you know, go wild. And so there's cattails and, and reeds growing along the side, which is you know, a fair bit of good habitat for, for birds, both for breeding as well as for feeding. And some people like lawn right up to the edge of the water. And so they just get rid of anything that's not grass right up to the edge of the water. And that is essentially destroying useful habitat, both for breeding, but also for foraging as well. So. I know that some people really like these, you know, nice, pristine looking sort of ponds where everything's perfect, but that can actually reduce the quality of some of these wetlands uh, for, for marsh birds. Thank you. Both of those answers are really great. April, did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? No, no, that's great. Okay, well, I do apologize that we, ha we didn't have more time for questions this evening. Um, but we do have Mirna Kipnaswe from Walpole Island First Nation here to do a, a closing for us. So I'm going to let her jump in and do her closing. Welcome, Mirna. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't start my video, so I'll just uh, I'll just do the prayer right now. I was really interested in all of all of the the presentation. I uh, we had some delay getting me on here, but that's okay. You know, one of the things I can recall as a child, because uh, my dad liked to fish and hunt, and um, he he was, uh, that's what we did. Like, that's what we did. And even though I was a, uh, a girl, I still went wherever my parents went. And they would go hunting and fishing. And yes, I can recall someone saying about how the, the sky, the ducks and that just blocked out the sun. I, I can recall that because I used to be taken all the place, uh, places that my parents went, I went. And so that was hunting and fishing. And I also, with my dad and mom, we went muskrat hunting. So it's all of those things that are, are part of my, my growing up in my childhood, as well as probably the other ones in my, my age area. So it's really good to listen to the, these kinds of things. It's unfortunate about those PCBs. It's uh, when you're when you're in the community, you know that your relationship was is with creation and the earth and all of those living things. And so it's important for everybody to understand that that we are the caretakers of this place, this place we call the the earth because we're responsible for all of those things. We have responsibility. It isn't just a, a pleasure. It is for us to take care of the earth and all those things that, that are dependent on the earth. And I just like to make that comment. And uh, I would like to close us with a prayer, which um, I really feel is really important, that connection to all of creation. So I ask you just to take a few moments and close yourself, close your eyes, put your feet flat on the floor. And even though you, we are in different parts of this creation, we are still connected to the earth through the, our feet because we walk on the earth. We also hear for all of those living things that depend on the earth. So I'll just start the prayer. <laughs> for this most beautiful day and this most wonderful life. Jimmy Gretsch for bringing us here together at this time to learn together, to be at one together as one heart, one body, one mind, and one spirit. I say Jimmy Gretsch to, for all of those ancestors who are looking kindly in our direction, the ones who left those pieces pieces along the trail for us to pick up. And I'm really glad that people are picking these things up. I say chimigwech to 
all that is from the sky world to the earth plane to the underground and all those Nokomasag and Mashomasag that walked on this creation before us and were doing their responsibility to take care of the earth and all those things that were dependent on earth for life. I say chimigwetch to the, the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the food we eat. Chimigwetch for all the four colors of man, the yellow, the red, the black, and the white. I say chimigwetch to you. Chimigwetch gajem nado for opening up our hearts and our minds and our spirits. To know that we are together responsible for this creation. Right from the sky world to the earth plane to the underground. Because we are the ones that will leave the legacy for our children our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren yet to come. I say to miigwech to that and ask, ask all of you to pick up your responsibility to take care of the earth and all creatures that depend on the earth for living and breathing and drinking. I say to miigwech to you, Nikanagana, all my relations, I hope. Miigwech. Manor, thank you so much. I'm so pleased that you were able to join us this evening and thank you for those beautiful words. Uh, and thank you to all of our presenters and panelists this evening, as well as all of those who are able to join us. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation today, we do have two pro door prizes to give away. Uh, so we will contact our winners by email tomorrow. So please keep an eye on your inbox. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the content presented this evening, please feel free to contact me dire directly and I'll strive to get those answered for you. Uh, I would also like to mention that we are still conducting our fish consumption survey. So if you fish in the St. Clair River or you know anyone who does, uh, please uh, see the link in the chat box that will direct you to our fish consumption survey. Um, and as well, we do have another, there, or there is an event coming up that I'd like to make you aware of. That is the 2021 Binational Lake, St. Lake St. Clair Conference that is being hosted on November 9th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. It provides a binational forum to exchange information on Lake St. Clair's changing environment and the actions and tools needed to manage these changes. It's a virtual conference organized by the four agencies and is open to all. Um, Donna, I believe, will be posting another link in the chat box uh, that you can use to register. So I hope you all have a fantastic evening, uh, and I hope to see you all at our next virtual session. More details uh, to come soon. Take care and have a great evening. Miigwech, Bomopi.